right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Rick right now. And as many of you guys know, uh, Rick, he's a very active member in our group. He looks at a lot of the comments that um, you guys are posting in regards to questions. So um, Rick is a professional dog trainer with 46 years of dog training experience. So um, he has worked with uh, celebrity dogs, um, such as um, his studio is very, very famous here in California. Um, the studio has worked with Lassie and Ray Tin Tin. He's also worked with uh, mega celebrities such as Tina Turner. The list goes on. I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about him before. So it uh, doesn't need much of an introduction. I'm going to go ahead and let Rick just dive right into the call. And uh, we will just actually have a really nice natural conversation and Rick can do his thing. So thank you for joining okay. us today, Rick. Okay, great. Well, again, thank you all for uh, being here today and giving me an opportunity to talk to the group. Um, I do want to say one disclaimer here again before we get into some things, and that is I have been exactly where you guys are today. I did not know when I got my first dog that I was going to later be 46 years into my profession and with the amount of information I now have. So I wanna make a statement here again that says, when I say some of the things that I say, and you guys may not like hearing what you're hearing, please understand, I have made every mistake you guys have tried or made at least twice before I got to where I got. So that said, I wanna to talk today about rearing a puppy from ground up and the first six months. I think given all the questions that you all have given me, which I have and I'm going to deal with, do really have so much to do with foundation development. So initially, you know, we tend to get our dogs at eight to 10 weeks old. That is the wisdom of professional breeders as to the age that we receive dogs. And there are two issues here. There is raising of a dog in a house and raising of a dog in an apartment. And there is a big difference, although anything can be made to work, but it is also always more um, difficult to do this in an apartment than it is in a house. But we'll talk more about that later. Initially, what I wanna talk about is to say that even if we're in an apartment or a house, the first month or six weeks or two months are pretty easy because dogs sleep 90% of the day away. You know, they're happy to wake up and get active when we do, but when they're young and babies, they sleep 80 to 90% of the day. So rearing a puppy in an apartment or a house the first month or two isn't as difficult as it's going to be a little bit later. But now let's talk about the foundation of rearing a puppy. The first thing that comes up is always, do I crate or don't I crate? And I'm here to tell you, the people that do not crate their dogs are going to be in the group without question that are going to have problems in months to come and that call people like me and say, Rick, what do I do? My dog is behaving thus and so. And what we need to understand is rearing of a crate, it's so easy that we want to bring our puppies to our bed and love on them and sleep with them. And you can do that, some of that when you're with your dog during the day. But you need to do two things with a puppy. One, there has to be a break from you and the puppy during the day, a puppy needs to learn that when they are by themselves, they have to be okay. The more you are with your dog as a nonstop Siamese twin, the more you're going to have a problem when you need to try to separate from that puppy. And believe me, that's going to be a major problem. So crating is important. When they sleep at night, my recommendation is they got to go to a crate. And during the day, morning and afternoon, I recommend that they're put into their crates for quiet time, independent of you, and not sleeping on your chest. They need to have that time away from you and be okay. 
every time people talk to me about separation anxiety, it usually is coming from what we're talking about right now. And let me say this, there is always differences between emotionalities of dogs. There is a genetic marker that always trumps what we do behaviorally. And what I'm meaning by this is, there are dogs, even if you put them in a crate, I hear people say to me, they'll call me and say, Rick, I've listened to you, I've put my dog in a crate, he is screaming eight hours in this crate, and I don't know what to do about it. That is a genetic abnormality. There are those dogs that this will happen with. And what do we do about it? Well, we may get creative and try putting them in an exercise pen. Sometimes that will be adequate to help you. But I must tell you that I can't spend the time talking about the abhorrent or the uh, 1% or less than 10% of the dogs that don't react well in a crate in this conversation because we have to hit everybody or as many people as we can. So suffice it to say, crate training is mandatory. And that's going to be from eight to who could, maybe nine months, maybe a year old. And the reason is not just for the independence, but it's also because of destruction. Uh, that dogs that are left loose can, if, even if they're just in the kitchen or in a utility room, they can take the molding off the side of your homes. They can take down your stucco and drywall, and they do. So crates are uh, cost-saving devices. Not only are they to give them independence, but crates are cost-saving devices. All right. So now we're talking 8 to 10, 12 weeks old. During this time, from 8 to 12 weeks old, what our job is is to really enjoy our puppies, have them housebroken, and to get them used to wearing little collars around their neck. Um, you know, housebreaking, again, is key to eating and going out to the bathroom. If you want your dog housebroken, your veterinarians may say that free feeding is the healthiest thing you can do. Maybe that's right, but it doesn't do anything for housebreaking. So I don't, am not an advocate of free feeding. I'm saying that we should feed our dogs twice. By the time a dog is eight weeks old, certainly nine by 10 weeks, they can go to twice a day feeding. So instead of feeding three and four times a day, which I hear, and I got to say is crazy, um, you take the same amount of food. And let's say on an average for a doodle, that's usually about, you know, 40 pounds, 30 pounds, 25 pounds you're going to go from two to three cups all day. So it may be one cup uh, twice a day, one and a half cups twice a day, two cups twice a day, but twice a day is adequate feeding. As soon as they've been fed, we take the dogs out. We can even control water and give them water right before we take them out. And that's more relevant if we live in an apartment versus a house, but a house, we can put the water outside. Apartments, we can't. So we may be more controlling of water in an apartment. And then again, we are going to put a collar on a dog somewhere about 10, 11, 12 weeks old. And of course, what we're going to watch our dog do is walk against the wall and upside down and trying to do everything they can do to get that collar off of them. But that's really what we're doing is just getting them used to wearing a collar. Everything we do with a puppy in the beginning is dog training. So we start dog training from eight to 10 weeks old, but when do we formally start training? I'm gonna deal with that in a minute. But the other thing that I wanna deal with that I did say my first call, but maybe we have some new people, and it really bears another statement. When a veterinarian tells you that they don't want you to take their dog out until after all their shots are given, I give you some information to mull around in your mind. First of all, I am agreeing that we don't take our puppies at 12, 13 weeks old to a dog park. And I'm agreeing we don't take our dogs to a forest preserve in that early stage. 
but I don't agree that we can't take our dog out in front of our homes and walk up and down a, uh, a few houses or back. And I don't agree. I don't agree that we can't uh, take our dogs and uh, put them in the car and go to Starbucks and get a cup of coffee while our husband or our wife is holding the puppy outside while we get a coffee and have our puppy stay outside. So uh, I think that for socialization, it's very important that we take our puppies to these places outside of our home for them to be socialized at this early stage. It is so important. I can't tell you how many people I hear that called me over the years and they're calling me about five or six months old and they're telling me that, you know, they listen to their vet. Now they're taking their dogs out and their dog is ferociously barking at things that they see because this is the first time they've ever seen them. So I must tell you, taking your puppy out in a realistic way for a quick drive, going to Starbucks around the corner, up and down your block is a good thing to do. Now, here's the other thing. The key to your breed, as far as I'm concerned, to a healthy rearing is exercise. It is as important to a doodle as is food and shelter and love. So exercise is so crucial. For you that have a house, the best thing you can do is try to find family, friends, neighbors that have a puppy similar to your puppy's age because we have to be very careful what we do with our puppies when we're getting them exercise and what we do with them because anything that happens to them as a young puppy under six or seven months old absolutely can imprint and mar them for the rest of their life as anything we do positively can assist them and develop them for the rest of their life. So it is crucial that you do not put your puppy and yourself in a situation that is destructive or over, overwhelming. For example, let's just use a quick example. You're going to maybe call up a friend and say, hey, can I bring my dog puppy to your house? You know they have another dog and it's an older dog. And you get there and you don't really ask enough of the right questions and you bring your puppy into the house, even if you're holding it and their dog barks and lunges and tries to uh, attack your dog. That one experience can mar your dog at the right age to mar it for a long time to come. So you need to be so protective of your puppy up until six months and thoughtful that you don't allow your puppy to, um, you know, experience any of these uh, traumatic things. Now, here's another thing I want to say in relationship to all of this. If I had a question, somebody posed this to me years ago, and it's an example that I use to my clients all the time. If I had the best trained dog in the world, let's say a six-month-old, seven-month-old, eight-month-old puppy, but didn't have a good resource for exercise, in reverse, let's say I had the best uh, criterion for having my dog exercise, but not trained, which would I think is the most valuable? And hands down, with no thought, it's exercise. Because if you take a well-trained dog but keep him frustrated in crates or apartments, and even on walks, because it's not enough for a walk, it's better than a poke in the eye, I'll give that to you. But it is not enough. A dog, a young dog, just like children, need to run and play with other dogs their age and roll around and have a great time. So I say exercise trumps obedience training early on and really even later on because a dog that is well exercised is going to be less of a problem than the highest of trained dogs that's not exercised and frustrated. You will have more behavior problems off of that well-trained dog but not exercise. So just keep that in mind. That's a very important 
statement that I think is, uh, is, is helpful. Now, let's talk with one other issue, and that is neutering versus not neutering. Um, you know, there's so much conversation now about um, the growth plates of dogs. And if I neuter my dog before the dog is a year and a half old, I've been told my dog's growth plates, or I've been told all kinds of statements about their maturation will not be as good as if I neutered my dog early on. So again, my answer is, if you have a dog making you nuts, and it's six months old, seven months old, and it is barking, and it is humping your leg, and it is going crazy, that's a dog yelling for you to think about neutering at an earlier age than 18 months or even a year. And if your dog is calm, cool, and collected, and you want to wait till that period of time because you're not having any problems, absolutely fine. Why not? But that veterinarian that gives you that uh, information about not neutering that dog is not living with your dog. And you that are living with him and her, and they're making you crazy, you need to come up with what's the best plan of action for you and your own dog. So I would say that it's very important to keep some of these things in mind. And uh, the neutering, you know, listen, I used to work at Guide Dogs for the Blind. Uh, I don't think that there's any dogs other than the monks of Skeet, and Guide Dogs for the Blind have been as is instrumental as the monks of Skeet at putting things in order. Um, all the dogs at Guide Dogs were neutered a year old and then put in strings for the development of their uh, work as a guide dog. Um, and there have been dogs that were neutered earlier by uh, definition of talking with trainers and the vet, but on an average, that's when it's done at a year old. Again, if I had a hyper dominant, overly sexual dog, I would neuter it younger. Uh, all right, so now we're talking, um, when do we start training? I, there was one of the uh, questions that was written this week about a puppy three months old. And it was very difficult to work with that puppy. And I'm going to tell you, I would not be working with a puppy that's four, three months old. The earliest that we took dogs in our facility were four months, 16 weeks. And this again was from Guide Dogs for the Blind. Um, uh, that's where uh, their 4-H program started and the training started was at 16 weeks. And they found that dogs that went through that early training had a huge percentage of Finnish Guide Dogs later than dogs who were not trained at that young age. But by the way, when we took dogs into my kennel, these are professional trainers working with a dog and over the years I educated them they used to see me doing the puppy work and then I educated them how to do it and done correctly by a professional 16 weeks is a great time to start training if I was not a professional and didn't have good advice or even going to Petco by the way guys or PetSmart is not good advice um, professional dog trainers, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, what is a good professional dog trainer, uh, but if you're going to train your own dog, I think the age that looks at it to be the best would be six months of age, give or take. One of the reasons why, that's where we leave imprinting. As we walk away from six months, it is less impactful for a dog to have a negative encounter they're more likely to walk out of that and be okay as they were if they were four months. So six months and up is where you ought to start working with your own dog. Um, and, uh, you know, beyond that, let me deal with what, how you evaluate a trainer. Um, you know, there's a few ways to have your dogs trained. One is a group class. One is private lessons. And the third is inboard training. Um, no matter what you do, you need to, these days with the internet, um, it's such a cool thing to have reviews and statements made about dog trainers. Any good trainers very quickly are going to have a good information put on the internet, of, internet about them. And bad trainers are very quickly going to have information put on them. So 
whether it's a park class or private trainers or an inboard training facility, I think Google reviews, Yelp reviews are your best way to get information. Now, you know, you also have to read between the lines. Sometimes people will give a bad review for all kinds of stupid reasons. I had a client give me the one bad review that I think we got in years uh, because they didn't like my consultation with them. I told them something that they didn't want to hear and they kept looking for a dog trainer that told them what they wanted to hear. And by the way, they later said that they had success with that trainer. That's fine. But that's not a review that somebody should throw me in the, un, under the bus over. The reviews, you'll know the difference when they start telling you stories and it makes sense about what you're hearing. But I will say, in my experience, an inboard training uh, kennel with professional trainers that train dogs every day are the people that you want to get information from. Because we are people that every day of the world, we're training dogs and we learn all the time. So yeah, we make mistakes too, but we learn from them. And if, a, if you see a professional training kennel that's been in business a number of years and has had good reviews, that's some place you can get information from. When you get a private trainer, you go to a park class. You know, the best thing I can say about that is, a park class, go to the classes when you see, um, and, and that's a way to get a feeling of, about how the classes are being run. When it comes to private trainers, again, you need um, uh, Google or Yelp reviews. Um, but the bottom line is, and let's talk about one other thing. When we start dog training, uh, again, I'm sorry, uh, you know, Halties and buckle collars are not my way of dealing with dog training. I use a choke chain. Now, again, not a prong collar. I don't use prong collars. And over the years, I refuse to let my dog trainers use prong collars. I think that's very extreme and over the top. For a good dog trainer and even for a family pet dog, a choke chain is adequate when you learn how to use it correctly and we're not putting a puppy in heavily distraction and using a choke chain or any tool, by the way, when a dog is kind of out of control. When we start dog training with a puppy, we start in a quiet, non-stimulating environment. That is the place we introduce, first of all, our choke chain, second of all, our basic commands. And then as the dog does better and better, as the days go, we increase the distractions a little bit as we go each day. And we build on building blocks of the obedience. Now, before I go into that, I don't want to get into that today at this moment, or maybe I will a little later. But suffice it to say that everything we do with a dog in my point of view, is done in gradations. They are gradually, gradually, gradually adding building blocks onto the day and the weeks before and building. Now, let's talk about the next food, the next thing rather, food versus not using food. Every good dog trainer I know, and anybody that's doing a good job with dogs, I do believe food is a good, introduction for beginning of training. Now, years ago, before food really became uh, forefront, I used to see it, unfortunately, as a, a lazy man's way of training a dog. Because when I was working with a dog, I learned and was taught, you need to put yourself in that dog's head. You need to interact with that dog like you're dancing. And that's the best analogy I've ever heard put into what we do with a dog as a professional trainer. So the way we get a dog looking at us is moving and turning and talking and praising. And it's a lot of work to get a dog to do that work. Later on, as food was used, it was brought to me by my trainers. And they said, hey, Rick, you know, when we're out here every day, 
I'm telling you, for the puppies, the food is great. And I began to watch it, and I went, wow, it is. And it's a quicker way to respond, and it's less uh, problematic. And we can teach that dog to look at us quicker and get our attention better. But it is not the kind of training of clicker training where you're walking around with a bag of food and clicking and training. I, you know, to me, I'm sorry. I think that doesn't have a place for pet dog training. That clicker training is, from my experience over the years, done and professionally done and absolutely the right way to go in canine or animal actors. They are being fed as they work. And they learn that they have to hit that mark the first time. And whatever behavior chain they're being trained for, they need to hit it the first time out of the gate. So food is used in their life as being fed. And clicker training is where I've learned that's the way studio actors were trained and, and dealt with is by clicker training. When it comes to us as pet dog people, which is what we generally are, and that's what I say I am. I'm a pet dog trainer. I'm not uh, the highest level of protection dog trainer, although I've done that work and I understand it. I'm not a scent discriminating dog trainer, although I've done that work and understand it. What I came in love with was pet dog training. People like yourself calling me and saying, Rick, I'm having a problem with my dog. Can you help me? To me, over the years, that's been my passion. This is what I live for. And this, to me, has been very self-rewarding because at the end of the day, over the years and over all the years of doing inboard training, I found that my clients, after going through what we gave them, could not wait to get their dogs into the kennel for training again for any new dogs they got because inboard training was a gift, even though it's expensive, that gives back to you every day, every month, every year that you have your dog. If you learn how to incorporate that training that a good inboard dog trainer will give you, that will be the kind of thing that will last forever with your dog. But here's what happens. A lot of times we train a dog for basic training, which was one month, Second month, which was off-leash training with high distractions and where we use a remote collar, the e-collars. And we would give the dogs back to our clients. And we give, by the way, with our basic training, one month, we gave a week of lesson before the dogs went home. That means three to four lessons before they took the dog home. When it was eight weeks of training, if it was done consistently, you know, four weeks and then the second four, we gave our clients two weeks of training. That meant they were going through four to six to eight lessons before they got their dogs home. And I would send the trainers to their home for the basic training. They got one free in-home, and for off-leash, they got two free in-homes. So that meant after we did all the work at the kennel, we would go with them to an open park for off-leash, or we would go to them with them to a, a, a shopping center if it was on-leash. And they could come back to us forever for more free lessons. That's what I offered in my programming. And it was a wonderful. So basically, that's some of the foundations of the way I see things. And, you know, now what I'd like to do is I'm going to look at some of the uh, uh, questions that you guys had that I wrote down. And I'm going to try to answer them for you and uh, see where we go with this and then open this up for other questions that maybe you have. So let's talk with a few of them. Um, one of the questions was teaching the dog to pay attention. I think I dealt with that by the concept of dancing with your dog and or using food as a treat. And occasionally the first foundation of healing and sitting is every time they sat, we gave a treat for them to look up at us. And when they did, we gave them a treat. And then gradually, it was every other time and every third time to where they never knew for sure if they were going to get a treat, but they knew they needed to look up to us for permission, approval, 
and for a, uh, good, a good boy. So that's where we get attention. One of the questions was, how do I keep my dog calm uh, when it's around other dogs, a puppy or my other dogs? We don't keep a dog calm. That's impossible. That's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is, how do I set up my dog and myself to be successful when my dog is around other dogs or am I uh, going to be around other people? So we need to set the table. What does that question mean? Does that mean when people are coming to my house later? Does that mean when I'm walking down the street that I'm going to see people? That has to do with how old my dog is. If it's a puppy, he may not have seen that many dogs and he's interested and, and happy to be around. So we let that happen. We don't try to change that. We certainly, if we come upon a dog that's barking at my dog, I'm moving away from that. But if it's a social, wagging the tail, happy dog like mine is, we're going to gradually ask the right questions to each other. Now, let's talk about that for a minute. So we meet a dog, somebody that we see, and a dog's wagging his tail initially, but is a little older than our dog. We got to ask a couple questions right away. One is, is your dog friendly? Now, look. As soon as somebody hesitates and doesn't give you an answer, oh, absolutely, my dog loves everybody. As soon as somebody hesitates and doesn't give you that answer, I don't care what they're about to say after that, I'm moving on. Because that hesitation means they just thought of a time where their dog wasn't friendly, and I'm not taking a chance with my dog, and I'm thanking them very much, and I move on. And I'm going to step around them or do anything I can do that my dog doesn't walk by their dog. So, and I try to do it nicely. I'm not going to be an idiot, but I'm, I'm just moving on. They got to say, absolutely, my dog is 100% friendly. Then what we do is we let the leashes, that person and I, we let the dogs come nose to nose and we look at the behavior. If those dogs are continuing to let their tails wag and be silly and put their their head down and their two front paws out and they look like they're in play mode, we can gradually, gradually let them into the jacuzzi, interact with each other better, but being careful, absolutely not to let their leashes intertwine. That is the first mistake somebody can make. And when that happens, two dogs that were friendly can freak out because they are now caught with leashes that are wrapped around each other and they are freaked out, and that can cause a problem. So when you introduce two dogs, you've got to make sure that those leashes do not get entwined or entangled. So, you know, the introductions of dogs are very important on the street. So, again, you have to set the table. If you want people to come to your house that night, Maybe you got to take your dog to a park, and since maybe it's too young to be at daycare at six months or under, it's not been neutered yet, can't go to daycare, maybe you go to a park and put your dog on a long line and throw a ball, and you run your dog into the ground. So when your family and friends show up at night, your dog is pooped and doesn't want to jump all over him, but you put him on a leash and collar. I can't tell you how many clients I go to their house and. Their dogs are fully loose not, loose, not on a leash and collar. And some of them that were aggression, I, aggressive, I walk in the door and their dog is growling at me and I got to say, lady, put your dog on a leash. It's about ready to bite me. They think because I'm a dog trainer, I have some magical power that aggressive dogs are not going to bite me because I'm a dog trainer. And, you know, it's crazy. But when you have friends and family come to your home, Put your dog on a leash and a collar. And many times what I do is I tell you to have your dog outside if you have a house with a dog run. Let your family and friends come in. Later bring your dog in and have them on a leash and collar and introduce them. And they're more than likely not going to jump all over everybody because everybody is settled. They're not at the front door with the doorbell ringing. So that's number one. Number two, if you have an apartment, crate your dog in another room. Let everybody come in, settle. Let him be sitting 
and then get your dog out of the crate and bring them up to them. So be in control. If your dog is not on a leash and collar, how can you be in control of your dog? And how can you be setting up your dog to win as opposed to lose? So we don't calm dogs down. We set the table to our advantage. It's like if you're in a sales position, you want to close a sale, you better think about every option and every variable you can to make the best close to get the sale. Same thing with your dog. Um, let's talk about aggressive. Uh, it says uh, playing with a dog that's aggressive as a puppy. Should I do that? And the word is no. Absolutely not. When I see people play with their dogs and are roughhousing with their dogs, you're setting it up for your dog to be aggressive. Now, when we have Rottweilers and Shepherds, um, you know, that's especially problematic. But when we have Doodles and they are hyper and busy and active, you're setting that up. And then the next question you guys have for me when your family and friends come over is how come my dogs are out of control when people come over? And it's because we've played rough with them as a kid, as, as, a, as a puppy. They want to play. That's what they think is the way to be. When they're in a leash and collar with you, you control them in your home. At nighttime, we put them on a leash and collar and not allow them to be out of control. There's another tool that I've had over the years that Guide Dog for the Blind gave me, and that's called a tie-down. And a tie down is a cable. It's like putting a leash on a dog and tying it up to the wall. And they have about three feet that they can move around, but they can't go nuts. It's called a tie down. All my dogs learn to live on a tie down. It's a graduation from a crate. And that means when I put them on the tie down, that's the only game in town. They're not going crazy. They're not running at people. They're not jumping at them. They're not making me crazy. They bark at me. I go over there and I correct them. No, boom, 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 with the leash and collar, quiet. And I let them learn that that's okay. Now, again, I'm watching them because they can be destructive on a tie down. Uh, if I have any question, if I get a long distance phone call or I got to deal with something, my dog goes in the crate. He's not left on a tie down. And by the way, I never, ever go to dinner and leave a dog on a tie down. They're in a crate. A tie down is only for when you are in the house with your dog and almost directly in sight. If they're older, nine months to a year old, and you know they're not that destructive, then you can go in your bedroom and go you know, outside and take a look at something, come back in, but you do not leave them by the... Okay, so let's see what else. A second dog, another question. Um, they said, should your second dog be an opposite sex? From my point of view as a professional dog trainer, absolutely. Do I ever see same sexes be marvelous dogs together? Absolutely. Uh, the problem is, when you do have problems, it's usually same sexes that will cause those problems as they get older as they get more dominant. If they are similar of temperament and similar undominant of temperament, you may notice that later on when they start hitting 12 and 15 months and they start having fights, you got a real problem. Now you have to decide what do you do about that? And many times you have to decide sometimes, and I would say as many times as not, you may have to give up the dog if they're seriously fighting. Dogs that occasionally fight and roll around, that's normal. But dogs that have gone to the mat and almost have had the kind of fight that is, you know, so serious it freaked you out, yeah. If those happen more than once, twice, third time, sorry, one of those dogs got to go or you're going to be, you know, your veterinarian's best friend because you're going to come in there and have all kinds of veterinarian bills and the terrible damage done to your dog. So, you know, yes, an opposing sex is the way to go. But again, same sexes, I've had it happen wonderful. And I've had same sexes and, you know, they've been great. So this advice is a generic statement. It's not 100%. If somebody wanted same sex and they wanted females, um, for whatever reason, a lot of people 
don't like males or don't like females and they want a second dog. The best advice I can give is try to not have, if you have one dominant dog, get a submissive second dog. And that's the best way of making that successful. If you wind up with two dominant dogs, you're going to have problems. So that's another thing. Now, another question that was asked to me, which makes a lot of good sense, and people have problems brushing their dogs. And they don't think about putting their dogs up on a, on a table. The best way to groom your dogs is put them up on a table. When you try to groom your dogs where you're bending over them on the ground, besides it breaking your back, it puts them in a position where they're in control or they're certainly able to roll around and give you a rough time. But as soon as you take your dog and you put them up on a table, they go, whoa, what's up here? And wait a minute. And all of a sudden, they're in a different kind of situation and they're more apt to be groomable. Now, a lot of times we can ask a second person to hold the dog while we start to do this. And when we get dogs used to being up on a table, they learn to love grooming, but there is not a dog usually that starts out loving grooming. They're like children and, you know, people, especially, you know, young girls that, you know, love their hair being brushed. It's not always the way it started out. Later on, they learn to love it. Well, dogs do the same thing. Once they like it, you can put them up on the table and they'll stand for you for a long time. But again, this is a graduation of things to do. Now, professional groomers have grooming arms that go on tables, and they have a leash that goes underneath their rear end that clip up in the rear of the grooming table and prevents this dog from being in control. Groomers have all kinds of ways that they take your dog and make them a good specimen for grooming that you don't see. And they have all kinds of grooming aids and different kinds of mat splitters and brushes that do the work that you're not sure about. And so let's talk about one other thing that Courtney brought up to me. And that was about this business where we think that when we shave our dogs down, we're doing them a favor in the summer. Now, again, guys, just my, my uh, education from groomers and people that I've known that have bred breeds that have full coats, they will tell you that dogs that you shave their coat down, 95% of those dogs, what you're doing is you're compromising their skin and allowing the sun to hurt their skin. That dogs do not have sweat glands. The only place that they do have sweat glands is the bottom of their feet and their mouth. So when we think it's like us, where we have sweat glands, it doesn't help us to shave a dog down. What does help them is if you shave in their chest, from their vaginal or, or penis area to their front of their chest. If you have your groomer shave one line from that area, that helps cool dogs down. And uh, if you... Uh, uh, shave from their butts and create a path for them to eliminate in, that's another grooming, uh, you know, behavior that's helpful to keep your dogs clean. But shaving them down do not help them uh, keeping cool in the summer. So I got to tell you that. Um, and the tip on uh, separation anxiety the way we create things from not being problems are developing our dogs in uh, a correct procedural way so that we don't have separation anxieties. And by the way, we can do everything right and dogs will have separation anxiety. And why? Because they're wired incorrectly or they are we can that can be bred genetically can come down from a sire and a dam and you can do everything right and dogs can still have separation anxiety and there are solutions for that later we'll talk about that maybe in another chat but there are medications and there are some things we can do with those dogs but by the way there are some problems that are not solvable when you see in any kind of um, 
uh, dog trainers uh, say ads that they give and they say all problem solved, that's a trainer I would probably avoid. There is definitely no such thing as all problem solved. There are problems managed. I'll tell my clients when it comes down to certain things, when dogs are leash and collar aggressive and they're a year to two years old and they're really dominant and aggressive on a leash, um, the most I'm going to tell them is we'll make a dent in it. We'll make it better. We'll teach you how to manage it better, but we're not fixing that. And when people come to us and want us to fix, we are not fixers. That's not what we are. We are developers of behavior, and we are the people with enough experience to know when you can change and when you can't change something. And we become then what I used to say is the Hollywood Dog Training School and marriage counselors, because you guys will go to the mat arguing with each other over things when you talk to a dog trainer like me and I make a statement, you go, okay, that's great. But if you fight amongst each other, you guys are arguing and going to bed without talking to each other over some topic that a dog trainer could have helped you out with. So that's why it's a good idea to find a good dog trainer. Now, the last thing I want to deal with before we open this up is the question that Whitney brought up today about her experience in the country with her dog and her little son concerning her neighbor's dog and that traumatic, what could have been a traumatic happening. And Whitney, I got to tell you, you were brilliant in the way you handled that. I can't tell you how that was 100% right what you did. And I will say this to you about your neighbor. When a dog is running loose, family or your child, I don't care what that man said to you about what he thinks, how kind and how friendly his dog is. Had your son, let's, let's change that scenario, Whitney, and let's make it that your son was 9 or 10 and your dog now was 2 years old. And they're walking on their own property and you're trusting them because your son is 10 and you're in the yard and your dog and he are playing on your property and this dog comes running at them. And instead of standing there and not moving, and by the way, some dogs will attack you just like that either, but you have your best shot if you freeze and face the dog and stay there and do what you did, Whitney, by yelling, no and trying to give a command, many times that will stop the average dog. I'm saying the average dog. But let's say, again, you weren't there, and your son turned and ran, and your dog ran with him. That dog, who is so friendly, could have easily chased them down, and that could have been a 6 o'clock news story that nobody would want to read. And I don't care what that guy says. He does not know every variable and every scenario that his dog is solid in. I, as a dog trainer, have made mistakes 30 years into my career. Now, you know, I got to tell you, nobody is beyond perfect. And if I was that, instead of being a professional dog trainer, I'd be Jesus Christ, which I'm not. So what I would do if I was you, it was, I would call that neighbor and it sounds like he was a nice guy. I would have a conversation with him and tell him what I told you just now. And if he doesn't believe you, have him call me. Because I can't tell you how many situations were caused that way with somebody saying, my dog never has behaved that way. But today, Mr. or Mrs., your dog did behave in a way you didn't figure and caused the trauma. For example, if a dog chased at somebody and they even froze and they fell down and they broke their leg and the dog never touched the person, who do you think would be responsible if that was litigated? It would absolutely be the person whose dog scared that person and they fell down and broke their leg. So I got to tell you, Whitney, you were brilliant. So meanwhile, take that and be nice to your neighbor and try to explain to him how that could have gone south. 
and, and that he may not be aware of that. And so you've come to this meeting and you talk to a professional trainer who told you what I told you. And he needs to know that what th could have been out of that story, I'm so glad didn't become, but we hear it all the time at six o'clock news stories where they say, my dog never behaved that way before, but it did this time. So I'm so glad you guys brought this to my attention. I hope it helped. One last thing. I tell my wife, and I'm not, this is just my personal opinion. We live in the country as well. And my wife is not a dog person like me. She's learning and become more and more dog knowledgeable. But when she walks with our dog, she walks around with a cattle prod. And it is about four feet long. I think that um, uh, Courtney put it online for you guys to look at. And if you come across a coyote or an aggressive dog, the handheld unit that Courtney asked me about doesn't strike me as it can do much. You want something that's three to four feet that you can extend out in front of you to stop an animal attacking you or a coyote from attacking you or even a couple dogs attacking you. And so it's three feet long and you carry it with you. And, you know, that's what I think is safety. Uh, you can also carry a walking stick that can be used. That's not electric, but, you know, it just depends on where you think you could be going and what you think you could be experiencing as to whether or not you want to make that a walking stick or a cattle prod. So anyway, that's, I think, enough time for me. I'm going to put this back over to Courtney. This even went longer than I thought. But I hope this was helpful, you guys. And for now, Courtney, why don't we open this up? If you want to be the uh, intermediary on questions, I'll be happy to stay and answer questions for another 15 or so minutes if you'd like, if there's more questions about what I brought up. And uh, let's see what the uh, group would like to know. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I literally got goosebumps when you brought up the story about, you know, this could have been a six o'clock news story because um, some of you guys know that my brother-in-law, he is a plastic surgeon and he deals a lot with the face and even with his uh, cosmetic and reconstructive practice he sees permanent damage on a lot of people from quote unquote friendly dogs and unexpected attacks so thank you rick for, for clarifying that and now i'm yeah. going to turn all the questions over to the group so guys um we do have a chat a chat box section that you can see go ahead and type any questions and uh, we'll go from there Actually, one question, as you guys are typing out your questions, we did get a question from um, Mary Beth, and she was asking about the slip, uh, the slip chain. And so in okay. regard, in, how do you properly measure a slip chain? Okay. Well, look, a choke chain or a slip chain, however you want to call it, needs to be such that if your dog drops its head, the chain will not fall off. Yet it needs to be small enough that or not can't be small enough that it's too tight around the neck. If you can't easily get it off by moving the choke chain up to the high part of the neck and putting one ear and then the other and sliding the choke chain off relatively easily, it's probably too small. On the other hand, if the thing comes off too easily, that's not good either because when a dog is by itself, by the way, and this is a good question to have. If I have two dogs, I don't leave choke chains on both of them. I'm going to tell you. One time my wife and I were at home and we watched our two Rottweilers have their choke chains. We don't know how it happened, but it con they connected in a way that they couldn't get out from the, it, it was somehow connected. We happened to see it. We ran out. We stopped them. My son was there. We were able to hold the dogs while we undid it. From that time on, I never, ever, and I always tell my clients, if I have a young, stupid dog, I leave the choke chain on that one, but not the other. So I usually leave the choke chain on 
the little juvenile delinquent and have the nylon or a regular buckle collar on the other dog. I never, ever keep two choke chains on the same time with two dogs. Excellent. Okay, so our next question here is from Jenny. Her question is, we have been using a prong collar from our trainer. So her trainer suggested a prong collar. And now her question is, how do I best transition my dog to the choke chain? Okay. I got to tell you, Jen, you know, a, a prong collar, unfortunately, is somebody who is needing, you know, a prong collar is too severe. To me, I would say to my trainers, you know, the only time I would use a prong collar is if I had a woman that was 100 pounds and she had a Rottweiler that was 110 pounds, uh, then maybe we talk about a prong collar. But for the average dog, um, again, we introduce the slip or the choke chain where it's not highly distracting. If dogs are in high distracting areas, then then, of course, the prong collar will get a quicker response than a choke chain because we don't have enough foundation training on them. But we need to start out with a choke chain being introduced. Let's talk about this for a minute. This is really important. It's important for everybody. When I start out with a choke chain, it's in a quiet environment without too much distraction, and the foundation to the whole obedience circuit is healing and a sit command. To me, I don't go anywhere beyond that till I got a dog looking up at me when they sit, and I work to an automatic sit. When I stop walking and I stop, I want my dog to sit and look up at me. And the way that they do that is by me turning left and right, and in the beginning, slowly, and pat my sides and talking to the dog. And as we go, days and weeks go by, I move quicker and faster, and I want the dogs to sit when I stop, and I still use treats at that point. But I want to see before I start teaching, eat, well, I start teaching to stay at healing and sit, but I don't go into a down ever until I get good healing, left and right turns, an automatic sit, and a good stay. That's where I stay. That foundation, I don't move off of that until I get a good, uh, you know, of what I just said, healing, left and right turns, automatic sit, and a stay. Don't go to a down, don't go to a down stay, and I don't go to a recall till I get that. But I start out in a non-hyper or non-distracting area. And I don't start increasing the areas till I get good obedience. So you guys have to use your own, you know, best judgment. If you're having a jerk way too much on your dog, you're in an environment that's way too much. You got to back off. You got to go to another one. Now, that's not true with every dog. There are some dogs, guys, and the doodles fit in this classification. They're nuts. Your breed, you bought into a breed that's nuts. I can tell you that when I get a call and somebody says, I have a golden doodle, I have a labradoodle, before they even ask me the first question, I can spend 10 minutes passing their life in front of their face. And they go, how did you know what I was going to say? So again, it's because trainers, we've heard this time and time again. And your breed makes you work. None of you guys bought a doodle and thought you were going to have an easy go-round. And if you did, you made a major mistake because there's no such thing. It's not like buying a basset hound and, you know, getting five or six months of animation as a puppy and then they're, they, they kick back. You got a doodle. They stay active, you know, till they're two years old, minimally, and they're active. So you you got an athletic dog. So that's the answer, the best answer to that question. I completely second that one. Uh, Max, he just turned two. I think he's almost, I think he's like two years old and four months. And now he finally, finally settled down. And I did not trust him out of his crate until he was two. So our next question here right. is, what's the proper way to approach dogs on furniture, especially as puppies as they grow older? So it sounds like they want to keep their dogs off of the furniture. And how would you work on that? Okay. I, it's the easiest way possible. Never 
allowing them on the furniture. So um, let's say we're dealing with a 40, 30, 30, 35 pound doodle. Maybe I'd have a light little string leash when I'm with them in the house. And if I sit down and they try to jump on the furniture, first thing I do is maybe take them physically and put them down. I don't jerk them. If I'm dealing with a young puppy, I, 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 I try to temper everything I do to the personality and the dog's temperament. So the first thing I do is I take them by their physical self and I put them down and I say, no, off. And I give them a toy and praise them. If I got a dog that's jumping up seven, eight, ten times in a row, I may have to, he's telling you, whatever you're doing is not enough. So this is when a leash and a collar may go on. And maybe if it's a four or five, four and a half month old puppy, instead of a choke chain, I'd have a nylon collar on. But I would attach a leash to it and they jump up in that sofa. I'm jerking them down. And that's when I'd put them in a crate. Or when they're four and four and a half, five months, that's when I get them used to a cable or what I call a tie down. And these are all techniques that we do gradually, but it's just never let them up. From the day you take that puppy home, if you want him on your person, you get on the ground with him. Put him on your chest when you're laying on your floor, not when you're on your, on your sofa. And by the way, later on, you know, we have small dogs like Westies or Scotties. Some people don't mind their dogs on, a, on, a, uh, on furniture. Well, listen, I as a dog trainer can't tell you, you know, don't put your dog on a furniture. What am I? Who am I? Some people want that. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't want that, then here's what I'm going to suggest. But once you've given them chicken in the big house, they are not going back to hamburger helper. And for you to get them to be respectful of not getting on that furniture, the best advice I can give you is don't let them start. Get them their own bed. Get them something that will they'll enjoy. Now, when they're young and they're tearing things up, I get, um, I get moving material, uh, moving pads from Arbor Freight or anywhere I can find a moving pad. Those are great beds. They can't tear them up, and that's a great thing to get. When you have puppies, you need something that if they do tear up, you're not going to cry it wasn't a family heirloom or it's something that's almost impervious to their uh, con destruction, and that's a moving pad, is what I found to be the best kind of bed that they can lay on when they're young, is a moving pad. Okay, perfect. So our next question here is, how do you stop a dog from jumping on people and play biting? He is seven months old. Okay, that's already, that dog should have learned that at four and five months. And again, this is starting earlier. Leash and collar goes on. We've introduced the choke chain around four months. We've started training. At, well, let's say it's six months. Let's make it that you guys are lay people. If the dog is jumping and you haven't introduced the choke chain till six months old, and we're talking four or five months old, and you haven't found the right trainer, then you put a buckle collar on. You can even, if you got a tough dog, you know, and you guys know which ones those are. Uh, the ones that, you know, you give them a, a leash and collar correction, they look at you and they laugh at you. You know you can use a light choke chain. But the point is, you cannot stop them jumping without a leash and a collar. And that's how you teach them. So walk them up to somebody, make them sit. Have that person pet them and talk to them in a quiet, soothing voice. Do not let them go, oh, Brownie, how you doing? And right away, that's like pouring kerosene on a fire. You try to, you, no, you don't try. You tell them, do not talk to my dog in a high-pitched, animated way. I want you to pet Brownie while I inter allow you to pet him. And if he jumps on you, stop petting and back up. I'm going to correct him and tell him, no, sit, and we're going to do it again. And we're going to keep doing it till Brownie learns to sit. And then your, your family or friend can give the treat and let him get rewarded for sitting. Pretty soon, he's going to be happy to sit for that treat while you control your family and friends and neighbors teaching them how to be. Dogs do not have, by the way, any preconceived notion about the way the world works. 
The only thing they know is what you set them up for. So if you set them up for success and exactness, that's what they'll give you. They don't know sloppy versus exact. If you want exactness, So keep that in mind in every behavior from every age up till, say, a good year, year and a half. Later on, if you want to change behaviors, for example, let's say you got a great dog and you decide you want to allow this dog on maybe one piece of furniture that you can train for. You may be able to do that later when a dog is a year and a half, not when he's four months. But really, there's no sense in changing the game in the middle of your world. If you've decided you don't want a dog on furniture, that's a universal truth as far as I'm concerned. And uh, none of my dogs are ever allowed in furniture. They don't even question it. Okay, perfect. So we, our next question here is from Kayla. And her question is, what is the best way to work on making a dog more independent? So for example, she doesn't want her dog following her from room to room at all times. She said that her dog is always friendly, but she wants to get a second puppy, but she's worried he might become jealous and would like him and she would like her dog to be more independent before bringing a second pup home. And one thing okay. about doodles. Let me ask. Let me ask her one question. Does she live in a house or an apartment? Okay, Kayla, could you let us know if you live in a house or an apartment? And while she's typing that, my answer, instincts tell me it's going to be a apartment. So she said house. And one thing I could okay. say with doodles is my doodle follows me all over the place too. So yeah, her answer. Okay. Is she lives all right. Let me tell you this: every dog in the world does what she just described. So, you know, if you have one dog, every dog goes to the bathroom with you and lays out front or you bring them in. Every dog follows you to the bedroom. Every dog follows you everywhere you go. That's the nature of animals. Now, we get the second dog. How do we create, uh, so they don't, that's where the tie down Kayla comes in. But I must tell you, uh, dogs just do that. That's part and parcel with owning a dog. It's like saying, you know, my baby su sucks his thumb, a, 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 a brand new baby, months old, you know. That's what they do. They suck them. And dogs follow us. That's part of what they do. So, you know, if you start seeing that that is causing some form of jealousies, yes, that's when you may try creating one and showing the other that it's going to get some freedom. For example, we have a young dog and the older dog gets a little possessive. Well, we got to start scratching our head. That's not great. As long as there's no aggression, you can use a tie down, you can use a crate. But basically, those are behaviors that I think are part and parcel with owning dogs. They're going to follow us. That's how it is. Another um, idea, what do you think of this, Rick? Because you know, um, and all of our group members know, most of you guys know, I live in a condo, Simon and I, and we have three dogs. Okay, so I do, we're going to be moving to a house shortly with a yard. Um, however, I do use a baby gate to separate them when they're just too nutso and they're too hyper. What do you think about baby gates? I love them. Yeah, of course. Baby gates are great. You know, you can put them in the kitchen if you don't want them all over your guests and family instead of crating them. If they're reasonable in the kitchen with a baby gate, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, absolutely. We use any aid that is reasonable. And that's why we want a dog to be used to a crate. Because if we only use a crate when our friend, friends and family come over, we crate that dog, it's going to be barking for all three hours that those people are there. So it's so important that dogs are used to a crate, used to tie downs before your family and friends come over. And you work on them not jumping. By the way, you can work on him not jumping up on you the same way by patting your chest and asking them to sit. And every time you pat your chest, you expect them to sit. So when people come to your home, they start patting their chest. No, oh, no, Courtney, it's okay. I love dogs. But they're patting their chest. The dog sits because Courtney's trained her dogs to sit when she pats her chest. So just another side trip. Hey, that's a cool idea. Um, so Kayla, she just uh, followed up with some more info here. She just said that she wants to make sure that her dog's personality doesn't change from happy-go-lucky when she brings another pup into her house. Rick, this is a really common question we get in our group. A lot of our group members are going, they're going from one dog 
to bringing in another puppy. And some of them have a question like, should I get my second dog when my other dog is a puppy? Should I wait until yeah, my dog? That's a good puppy? question. Okay. My answer is I usually say, get the first dog in order. That's when they're about a year, year and a half, then get the second dog. And that's what makes more sense to me. Or get them at the same time. Because um, if you get them at the same time, and let's say your husband's willing to take on one and you're willing to take on the other, then that can work. And you get them at the same time, they're raised together. But I would not get a dog or two because thinking that I, you know, I don't want them to be bored and I want them to have somebody to play with. That's never a good reason, especially if you're a single person. You can't do two dogs like that. Better to take your dogs to daycare. And again, to go to daycare, they have to be six months and older and neutered uh, to go to daycare. So maybe another time we'll talk more about apartment and house questions. But my answer is either get them at the same time with two people going to help or wait a year, year and a half for the second dog. All right. So that's it for questions. I just want to thank you again so Great. much for your time. And uh, we'll chat soon. Okay. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Oh, oh, oh.